unfortunate reality is most new businesses fail. Some fail really fast, some fail a little bit slower, but most of them fail. Some people are stubborn and only want to take in confirming evidence and don't want to really listen to criticism. That's a recipe for failure. What can you tell me about the failure, how you detach yourself from the failure and kept moving? As an entrepreneur, you have to detach yourself from failure because it's part of the landscape. It's going to happen along the way. You get up and brush yourself off. You keep on going. Failure is an education on somebody else's dollar. Many of these mindsets, there's six of them. Those are the things that enable them to process information quickly, make decisions quickly, and act. So it's these mindsets that enable entrepreneurs to do what they do. Welcome to Execute and Outlast podcast, where we discuss strategies and tools you can use to scale your business to nine figures and beyond. I'm your host, Van Chantimur. This is Execute and Outlast podcast. Enjoy the episode. All right, John, um, welcome to the show. It's an honor to have you here. Thank you. Very nice to be here. I want to start with some of the uh, early day stories. Can you maybe start how you started your journey as an entrepreneur? And then maybe we can talk about how you switch your role to become an educator uh, afterwards? Like what were the some pivotal moments in your career? Yeah, so I I, uh, I think I learned to be an entrepreneur when I worked for the Gap stores in California a long time ago. Uh, Gap was a small company in those days and growing very fast. And I learned a lot about what it was like to grow a young business and to get things done quickly and without a lot of bureaucracy. And, and after working at Gap for several years, it began to get a little bigger. We got up to 400 stores. It was a little more bureaucratic, perhaps. And I said, well, maybe I've learned enough to be able to go do this on my own. So I left Gap. Did a couple startups over the next several years. One of those went public. That one failed. So I learned a lot from that one. And by the time I'd done all of that stuff, plus my earlier career in the U.S. grocery industry, I'd been in retailing 20 years. And I don't know if you know anybody in retailing, but 20 years in retailing is probably enough. So I said, okay, what should I do next? And did some career counseling and some thinking about what might be a good thing to do next. And here I am. I've been an educator ever since. Amazing. I think we learn a lot from, like we learn, we learn more from our failures than our successes as, as entrepreneurs. What can you tell me about the, the failure that you mentioned? Like what, what do you learn, how you overcome, how you detach yourself from the failure and, and kept moving? Well, I think as an entrepreneur, you have to detach yourself from failure because it's part of the landscape. You know, it's going to happen along, along the way. And you get up and brush yourself off and you, you keep on going. And as they say in California, failure is an education on somebody else's dollar. So, you know, that, it's okay. In, in our case, I, we, we were doing fresh pasta stores to, so people could, back in the days when pasta was considered health food and everybody was carbo-loading, it's different now. <laughs> Uh, but in those days, pasta was healthy and people wanted quick and easy meals on the way home from work. And so we were building fresh pasta stores to make that possible to do. Well, along came technology that enabled the pasta industry to put fresh pasta in little gas flesh packages that we now find in our supermarkets. And that really took the wind out of our sails. And, and we hadn't seen it com coming and we probably didn't adapt to it as well as perhaps we might have. So that took us down. In your book, the the new business road test, you actually talk about the like idea validation stage, the like how you can test as an entrepreneur your ideas, and it will be like maybe they will be effective or not. You you talk about a, a model called like seven domain model. It's a fairly like old book. It's ten years old, but it has some great gems inside. So it, mm -hmm. in the in that seven domains model, it it talks about like market attractiveness, industry attractiveness, missions, aspirations, etc. So after like ten years passed published did you add anything there like can we uh, learn from that book and maybe other teachings as well in that 10 years about idea stage and validation well actually it's 20 years now Merit. the very first wow. edition of new business okay. road test was in in 2003 um, wow. and here we are in 2023 so and, and there have been five editions of it and in each of those new editions i've added some new stories new examples to bring those those key ideas to light but fundamentally, that analysis has not changed at all that time. You know, you, you, you really have to ask yourself, is the market that I'm intending to serve an attractive one? Uh, number two, do I want to be in this industry and can I build sustainable competitive advantage therein? And number three, have I got the right team? And those are pretty fundamental notions 
that aren't going to blow in the wind, you know, they're everlasting. And I think that's why the book is still so commonly used. Do you think the when we approach a an industry, maybe maybe we don't know we are trying to learn, how can we trust our instincts about the product that we want to push and like problem that we want to solve versus just putting it out there and then getting feedback and iterating because it's it's very important to understand that of course nobody can be like Steve Jobs but it's like that focus towards your beliefs about the product and trying to push that onto the market is very important in my opinion so how do you see it is it how do you find the balance between your ideas and versus the like feedback from the market unfortunate re- reality is most new businesses fail uh, some fail really fast, some fail a little bit slower, but most of them fail. So I think we have to, as entrepreneurs, go in with that understanding. And if we're wise, what we then do is begin testing the assumptions or hypotheses that I call them. I, I think every new venture is actually at the very outset little more than a bundle of hypotheses that are waiting to be either affirmed or, or rejected. And I think it's our job as entrepreneurs to test those hypotheses as quickly and inexpensively as we can. And that's how we learn. And then we, you know, they, they call it a pivot today. We make some changes if we need to make changes based on what we learn on that journey. I think that's what you have to do. That doesn't mean you don't have to have conviction in your beliefs, but often it means, so as Eric Reese defines a pivot, he says a pivot is a change in strategy, but not a change in vision. And I think that not is really important. It's not like you oh. dump your idea and go do something completely different. You still want to get to the same North Star, but you've learned some things and maybe it's not quite the right customer. Maybe you have to tweak the product or the service, but you still want to go there. I think that's the nature of the process today. Mm-hmm. That actually makes perfect sense. It also touches your other book, Getting getting to, to Plan B. Um, you discuss business model adaptability. Can you maybe share your thoughts on how businesses can remain like agile and responsive in the face of like rapidly changing market conditions, especially now with the AI, et cetera, as well? Yeah, I, I think that's easy to talk about, but it's very difficult to do. The good thing is small companies and young companies can make decisions quickly. There aren't a lot of people engaged in those decisions. They can put come around, you know, come together around a lunch table and say, okay, our world has changed here. What are we going to do about this? And off they go. So I, I think the benefit of being small inherently builds agility into what every entrepreneur can do. You got to have the mindset and the willingness to change. Not everybody is is like that. Some people are are stubborn and only want to take in confirming evidence and don't want to really listen to criticism. That's a recipe for failure. But, you know, it takes all kinds of people. How do you think we can, when we are doing the pivot, most people that are working in the company are, I can say, like resistant to change most of the time. How can leaders explain this is the way to go is is it just communication or do you think is there something else there i think it begins with the kind of culture you build i I think if you're going to be a successful entrepreneur you want to build a learning culture and you say well here's where we're starting out on this journey but our guess is that we don't have everything quite right so if you want to join our company you're going to be on a learning journey with us you're going to be a key part of that learning journey and you're going to help us learn especially people who are at the cold face having you know contact with customers you need to use them to do a lot of the learning so i think it's about how you build the culture at the beginning and you and you build in key people who actually want to learn and want to change uh, not everybody's resistant to change let those people go work somewhere else that's not who you want you start up I'm I'm curious about this. What do you think about when we are trying to build this culture, it's important to cut C players, A players hire A players, of course, and B players hire C players. It's important to cut those C players, but how do you create that high-performance culture without creating a scary environment for the worker? A safe and high-performance. I don't think high-performance is unsafe in any way. Uh, what, what you do is you get a bunch of people in the boat, uh, the right people, as Jim Collins calls it, you get them in the boat, and then you empower them to make decisions on their own, and you work collaboratively to decide where the business is going to go and and how the business is going to get there. And you measure stuff, and you report those measurements so everybody can see them. And if everybody's got the data, it's not going to be just the CEO who says, hey, the the data is telling us something here, we got to make a change. Everybody will Mm -hmm. see that data. 
they'll all believe in that. I don't think building a high performance culture is in any way unsafe or risky to the kind of people you'd like to have in your boat. Given your like vast experience, what's the most under undervalued characteristic you see in like successful entrepreneurs? I don't know that there's a single undervalued characteristic. I mean, entrepreneurs are as different. Every one of them is different from another one like day and night. For every extrovert like Richard Branson in the UK, there's an introvert like Michael Dell in the US. For every PhD, you know, building a high-tech business, you know, Sergey and Larry at Google, there's somebody like Hansi Ukulaya, who's building a fantastic business called Chobani Yogurt, who's an immigrant. And who would have guessed that that business would have come from an immigrant recently uh, arrived in the U.S.? So they're all different and there isn't any any single path. You gave a lot of uh, examples from like different cultures. You have observed and studied like entrepreneurship from v- like, various cultural contexts around the world. Have you noticed any like universal similarities between these people, the successful entrepreneurs or businesses? Yeah, I have. And that's the genesis of my new book, Break the Rules, in which I I really drew on the last 20 years or so of my case study research that I'd done really trying to understand entrepreneurs. I've I've been very fortunate to have a ringside seat into the way entrepreneurs think and act because of all the executive education I do with them and the 50 some odd case studies I've written on entrepreneurial companies. And that intimate understanding that I've been so fortunate to have is what led to this new book. And what I discovered are there are these six mindsets that entrepreneurs in every culture have. It's, It's not that they're, you know, different in California from Europe or Asia. The most successful entrepreneurs share many of these mindsets. Uh, There are six of them. And those are the things that enable them to process information quickly, make decisions quickly, and act. Can we maybe expand on the six topics? Yeah, sure. So it's these six mindsets in this new book that I've called Break the Rules. And people say, well, what do you mean, John, break the rules? Do you mean we're supposed to break the law? Uh, No, (laughs) we're not supposed to break the law. But there are a whole bunch of conventional rules by which big business has sort of been conducted over the last you know, 30 or 40 years. And entrepreneurs have learned that those rules are, are made to be broken. And there are six of them. So, you know, if, if you like, we can talk through them. But the, the first one is what I call, yes, we can. So in business schools like mine and, and in other top business schools, uh, everybody's taught that what you're supposed to do in a, to build a successful company is to stick to your knitting. You know, you're supposed to figure out what you're really good at, develop some core competencies, build on those core competencies, enhance them, invest in them. And when somebody says, will you do something else? You're supposed to say, no, we don't do that. We'll stick to our knitting. Well, entrepreneurs don't necessarily stick to their knitting. I mean, they might some of the time, but when an opportunity comes along that they believe has potential that's outside their set of current competencies and that may not stick to their knitting in a conventional sense. They go, yeah, we can do that. And then they go back to the office and they go, holy cow, how the hell am I going to figure out how (laughs) how I'm going to deliver on that, right? That's what entrepreneurs do. And that flies in the face of what we teach in business schools about sticking to your knitting. So that's one. The second one is what I call problem first, not product first logic. In big companies today, so take Procter & Gamble, for example. I my family and I use use Tide detergent, and we can always tell when Tide changes its brand manager, because what happens is the product gets tweaked a little bit. You know, they take the blue speckles out and they put green ones in, and they call it new improve, or they change the scent from uh, sea breeze to mountain fresh, or what whatever you call it. You know, is, is this innovation? Come on, you know this this really is innovation. But that's because big companies are focused all the time on their product. What can we do with our product? Entrepreneurs are focused on problems. How can I solve a compelling problem for a customer that's not being solved well today? And if I can do that, then the customer's you know, going to buy my stuff. So I tell the story in the book about Phil Knight and Bill Bowerman, who founded Nike all those years ago. And they were both, uh, Bowerman was a track coach and Nike was almost a four minute miler. And they knew that the track shoes that were worn, that were being made for runners in those days by the German suppliers, 
weren't made for distance runners. Why? They were made for sprinters. Sprinters trained by running around the track. And tracks are, are nice uniform surfaces. But distance runners don't run around tracks. They run on dirt roads and country paths. And they step on rocks and sticks and sometimes rodent holes. And they get a lot of sprained ankles. They get a lot of shin splints from all the pounding of those miles and miles of training. And Knight and Bowerman said, you know, we distance runners have a have a problem, a visceral problem. You know, they felt it in, in, in their legs and ankles. We could build a better running shoe. Well, they set out to solve that problem that not every runner had, but elite distance runners had because elite distance runners were the ones training so so hard uh, and had the problem. So it, it actually took five years before Knight could quit his day job and devote full time to Nike. But we all know what's happened to Nike in that time. But again, the focus at the beginning was on a problem. It was not on a product. It's not like, oh, wouldn't it be fun to build shoes? No, no, no. It was, here's a set of customers, elite distance runners who have a real problem, and we could solve that problem. And of course, they did. And once they solved that problem, then they learned how to manufacture shoes in Asia or get them manufactured in Asia. They learned how to design shoes with the help of elite athletes. They learned how to get athletes to endorse their shoes. And from there, it wasn't a far cry to go to John McEnroe and say, let's do tennis. Michael, Michael Jordan. Michael Jordan? And, and, uh -huh. Yeah, wrong, wrong Michael. Michael Jordan and say, <laughs> let's do basketball. So again, problem focused, not product focused. And then the Nike story also brings to light the third of these six, these six mindsets, which is to think really narrowly about your target markets, not broadly. So uh, I think one mistake many entrepreneurs make is they say, well, I want to find a market that's really huge. And in almost every business plan I see my students write, the word huge is in there somewhere, right? Our, my market is huge, you know? No. What you want to do is focus on some tiny market segment that has a compelling problem that hasn't been solved that you could solve. So again, back to Nike. How big was that market segment of elite distance runners, people who could run four-minute miles? Well, there aren't a lot of those people, you know, and they were on the U.S. West Coast. Very small target market. But again, once you learn some things from the initial foray into your target market, then you can apply those things to move into wider markets. So entrepreneurs should think very narrowly about their product line and about the product market segment they serve. Let's see, that's three of them. The fourth one is what I call ask for the cash and, and ride the float. And it kind of grows out a little bit of my third book, The Customer Funded Business. But basically the idea is, if you can get your customer to pay you in advance, that's way better than going to a, a venture capital investor or an angel investor and saying, I got this wonderful idea. Would you give me some money to pursue it? You know, given that we know that plan A probably isn't going to work, it's a really difficult conversation once you burn the investor's money on plan A to go back to them uh, and say, well, sorry, I burned half your money. I had a conversation with one of my students just last week about the same thing. He's burned half the money and he's got a new new idea that he thinks is better. Uh, and his investors are saying, hey, give me my money back. You, you know, you burned half of it. We want the other half back. Well, they don't have any right to that money, but he wanted wanted to know what to do. The better approach is to find a way to get your customer to pay you in advance. That's what Michael Dell did. In those days, the very early days of PC computing, it was really difficult to learn anything about PCs if you were running a small business. You know, what do they do and what, what kind do I need? And the, the stores that existed at that time to sell them had a bunch of geeks who couldn't speak uh, any, any normal sort of English and you couldn't understand it. And Michael Dell said, look, I'll give you exactly the computer you need, but you have to pay me up front. So unlike Steve Jobs, who at about the same time was building another personal computing company, Apple, Dell built his with the customer's money. And if, and if you look down the road and, and ask yourself, now we'd all be happy to be either Steve Jobs or Michael Dell, right? They've they both done really well. But if you, if you look down the road and ask yourself who won a greater share uh, or who kept a greater share of the value created in the company, Michael Dell wins that hands down. And, and you know, who got fired along the way? Well, Steve Jobs did. Who still owns Michael Dell today for, and, and runs it? Michael Dell does. So, you know, if you ask for the cash up front, uh, that's what you want to do. And today, the, the most uh, stunning success of that model is Elon Musk at Tesla, 
when they set out to start Tesla, they said, well, let's, uh, you know, Musk joined a handful of other founders. He said, let's go see if we can sell some cars. So they did a little roadshow in California. They had not built Roadster number one yet. And they said, here's the car we're going to build. Would you like one? And in three weeks, they sold 100 cars at, at 100,000 per car. That's 10 million cash in the bank before they built car number one. Well, isn't that a much better way to to start your business than uh, pandering to a VC. So that's ask for the cash for ride the flow. Let's see, two more to go. There's, there's beg, borrow, but don't steal. So this one comes in part out of my own personal experience. When we started the fresh pasta business back in 1984, we weren't sure exactly how this was gonna work as all entrepreneurs aren't. So we said, let's not, you know, we had to have a plan to make fresh pasta that we were gonna put make into sheets and then cut before the customer's eyes in the store and a lot of theater to it where are we going to make those well we said well let's let's see if we can borrow a commercial kitchen instead of building one until we've proven the concept and we found a gourmet food store uh, that was closed in the evenings and had a commercial kitchen we put our pasta machine in there and we made our sauces in there and that got us started for the first year and a half until we had some validation of the concept and then it was time to build our own um, commercial kitchen. So if you can borrow assets that you need rather than, you know, building them up front, makes enormous sense for an entrepreneur. Last one, and I think a lot of people know this, is entrepreneurs don't like to ask permission for what they're going to do. You know, if the regulatory landscape is maybe ambiguous or unclear or, or hasn't contemplated what an entrepreneur wants to do, entrepreneurs just get rolling. And, you know, the, the shining example, of course, is Uber. You know, had they asked the regulators in San Francisco, gee, do you think it would be okay if we start a taxi company that doesn't own any taxis? <laughs> I think we know what regulators would have said, right? Mm -hmm. Unlikely that Uber would exist today, at least in its current form. Maybe we wouldn't even have a gig economy today. Who knows? Now, I don't condone everything that Google, that Uber did on its journey. There was some clearly unethical behavior along the way and a, a really crappy organizational culture. But the idea that when when the regulations are unclear in big companies, they go, oh, oh it's, we, we can't go there, right? And they, and they stop. Well, that opens doors for entrepreneurs to innovate. And that's one of the reasons why it's entrepreneurs, not big companies that create many of these innovations. You know, why was it Uber that created this model? Why wasn't it a taxi cab company? Why was it Elon Musk that created Tesla? Why wasn't it Chevy or Toyota or Renault or somebody. So it's these mindsets, I think, that enable entrepreneurs uh, in large part, no matter where they are in the world, uh, to, to do what they do. In very large companies, it seems it's very hard to keep up the like innovation and the small trying to see what's going to be the new thing. And they have like so much resource. Why do you think this is the case? I did a podcast with the Financial Times a couple of months ago with a guy named Michael Skopinker, who'd just written a book on that issue. And I think part of it is that in a big company, it's difficult to be a naysayer and say, oh, gee, you, you ought to watch out for that risk. So, you know, there's, there's more likely to be groupthink where everybody converges and they follow one point of view rather than having the courage to you know, say, hey, wait a second, there might be another way to do something here. I think that's one reason. I think another reason is people who want to innovate and want to um, do things differently are unlikely to be happy working in a stodgy, slow-moving big company. They're more likely to say, well, let me go work for an entrepreneur or let me be an entrepreneur. So I think it's hard to attract, you know, the right kind of talent in big companies. And as a result, some big companies have pretty much given up on doing meaningful new stuff. Procter & Gamble doesn't really innovate anymore. They just buy stuff, you know, yeah. when there's something new that comes along that an entrepreneur does that fits, uh, they'll buy that business. You know, they have a fancy name for it, but I don't call it innovation. Yeah, it's just, it's just, they are trying to, they don't work on the problem. They just have the money. I guess they just acquire whoever is like up and coming and hot in the market and don't give any shelf space. Like most of the, especially in, in retail, as you said, the shelves are so crowded and some of these brands are so huge. They just double you up if you, if you just like show your head a little bit. Yeah. And I look at the beverage category today and, and Coca-Cola over the last, gee, probably 15, 20 years now has innovated with its cola brand, Coke. So there's Coke and new Coke. That didn't work out very well. Diet Coke's done very well. 
Uh, now there's Coke Zero, that's doing very well. There was Coke Natural in Europe in test market, that didn't work. So, you know, they, they keep doing all this stuff with Coke and, and that's not really grown the base business. What has grown for Coke is when they buy stuff like vitamin water that somebody else invented, some mm -hmm. entrepreneur, and they go, oh, that's growing fast, we could do that, let's buy it. I guess the organizational structure is, is very important here. So for example, Google or when Amazon is trying to create the AWS, they create a separate entity outside, just a bit like outside the main structure. To, to give them a bit of freedom. Go, just try to disrupt this industry. I will give you like free reign. You have the money and just go disrupt that industry and then they bring it in. I guess that's a better way in terms of the organization. That's the way the successful big guys do that, but that's often very yeah. difficult culturally to do that. So, you know, who do you put in charge of that little unit? How do you incentivize that person in a way that doesn't piss everybody else in the organization off because that person has an opportunity to make a lot of money? It's challenging to do that, but you're right. That is the best way that, that many have done it. And that's the way Bezos built the first hardware product at Amazon. Who, who would have thought Amazon could build a hardware product? Well, that was certainly yeah. not in their DNA. They revolution, e-readers did exist before they set out to invent the Kindle but they were insignificant. Bezos created a two pizza team and said, get after it and feel free to disrupt our base business. I guess the impact of the founder and CEO in that case is extremely important because when you look at Apple's very hot streak of iPod, iPad, iPhone, like just back to back. And Remarkable. then after that, when, yeah, after that, when Tim Cook took over, it's just version iterations. It's like a very different approach. Operational efficiency is just trying to make a thing a bit better. Like iPhone 13 is just a bit better than 12. Like iPhone 14 is just a bit better than 13, maybe or maybe not even, right? It's very important. The, the founder effect is there, really. Yes, although I think everybody's pretty surprised with how effective Tim Cook has been. Everybody was concerned that when Steve Jobs was gone, that would be the end of Apple. And clearly that's not been the case. And you're right that Apple has done a lot of incremental innovation with the iPhone in particular. But they've also done a bunch of new stuff. The Apple Watch is one, and there's right. some now virtual reality products, another one. Not everything's going to be a hit, right? So it's not like Cook has pulled in his horns and said, we're not going to do anything new. But it's really hard to have you know, a hit that's as big as the iPod or a hit that's as big as the iPhone. You're not going to do that you know, every single time. I give Tim Cook it's, a lot of credit. Yeah. I think he's it's, done a great. It's just it's just like back to back. It's so evident that it was the pulling factor that's like was Steve Jobs. It's it's so interesting to think about that. Well, Jobs was a remarkable entrepreneur and a re remarkable CEO, and I think he had an ability to kind of look around corners and get a sense for what the customer was willing to buy and willing to pay for, even before the customer knew it. And that was his genius, and he was usually How right. Do you how do you think the, the entrepreneurship landscape has like evolved over the years? What are some current and maybe upcoming trends entrepreneurs like should be aware of, do you think? Well, I, th I think one of the challenges is the financing landscape. So financing for startups goes like a sine wave. You know, money comes in, uh, there's a lot of deals getting funded, maybe too many deals get funded then many of those fail. That means the funds that invested in them don't perform well. So those funds wash out, the sine wave drops to the bottom, and then the cycle starts again. I think we are currently in a phase where it's much harder to raise capital to start or to grow, either startup or growth capital, than it was uh, a couple of years ago or five years ago. And I think it's going to continue to be a little difficult until some of the frothy stuff that really doesn't have fundamental merit cash flow wise gets washed out and then maybe we'll see a return to fundamentals i mean cash is becoming much more important vcs are telling their portfolio companies you're probably not going to get a, another round so you better stop spending money you better figure out how to get to break even cash flow and the best entrepreneurs are doing that if their business is on sound enough footing to let them go there not all will make it it's very interesting to think about the biggest businesses were built after the 2008 crisis. Why do you think that kind of a trend happens? Do you think the, the money is loosening up to fund them? Or is it that they are like so good that they went through that stage and they survived because they are good? Why do you think well, that I is? Think, yeah, I think one of the things that happens in economic downturns 
is first, people working in big companies say, you know, it doesn't look like I'm going to get promoted here anytime soon. And it doesn't look like I can change jobs to another company anytime soon either. But if they're an ambitious person and maybe they have an idea for a, a compelling problem that some customer group has that needs to be solved, they go, well, maybe this is a good time for me to set out on my own journey. So number one, those downturns bring out entrepreneurs, right? That's number one. And there's a long history. Hewlett Packard was started in the depths of the Great Recession and Google was started, you know, in, in the OPEC oil crunch. Lots of stories like that. Uh, so that's one thing. The second thing is that when things turn down, the big companies pull in their horns. You know, they cut costs. They say, well, we're not going to do risky new stuff because this is a tough time to do it. So the result is that for the entrepreneur who's starting something, competition is now reduced because the big guys are pulling in their horns. And then the third thing is the cost of the resources you need, be that people or rent or you know various other resources you need to start a business, goes down when the economy is in a difficult time. Uh, so for all those reasons, I think downturns are a great time to start a business. And that's why we've seen so many really good businesses come out of each of the major downturns in the economic cycle. Now, are we headed for another downturn? You know, who knows? They say that economists have predicted 22 of the last nine recessions. They're predicting one now, but they've been predicting this one for quite some time now. Will we see it? You know, who knows? We'll see. But perhaps it's a good time to be prepared if you're, if you're an aspiring entrepreneur. How has your teaching career influenced your personal growth and like understanding of yourself and your approach to entrepreneurship? Do you think it helped? Yeah, I think it's worked both ways. The fact that I had been an entrepreneur and learned both from my successes and failures makes me a much better teacher uh, because I know, you know what my students and my exec ed participants are going through because I've been there. But it goes the other way as well. The fact that I've now had this ability to be in close touch with so many entrepreneurs over the last 20 years at London Business School has helped me as a board member, as an observer of the entrepreneurial landscape, and as an observer of my own career. So, so I think the learning's gone both ways. It's really been richly rewarding. Amazing. Was there a particular person or a mentor maybe like that shaped your approach to, to business and entrepreneurship? No, there isn't a single person. I mean, I worked with and for some great people. A, a guy named Jack Eubster, who I worked with at Gap and worked for at Gap, was a remarkable uh, entrepreneur, as was Don Fisher, the founder of the Gap. But, you know, we come across great people who influence us in various ways. I had a wonderful finance teacher at the Stanford Business School before I ever thought about being a, a professor, you know, that came 20 years later. But when I made my career transition, I said, I'm going to teach like Jim Van Horn at Stanford taught me. And that was teaching with, with cases. And that meant I had to write cases. And all of that activity then fostered my learning, you know. So it, it all comes together. I'm very curious. How do you go about like learning something new, especially maybe outside your area of expertise? Maybe like when you come up with a concept or when you're th trying to think about a new concept. So how do you do your research? How do you learn new things? Like what's your process? I think much of that is a people, people driven process. So I, I tell the story and break the rules about Arnold Correa, a Brazilian entrepreneur who reinvented his business completely for, on four different occasions. And today he's one of the biggest digital at home players in, in Brazil. But each time he identified an opportunity, he went out and talked to his customers and he, and he tried to figure out, well, is this opportunity something that you'd want to do? So he would basically be well along the selling path before he actually put any investment into a new opportunity. And I think that's what you do. There's a wonderful book by a guy named Alberto Savoia, who was, uh, I believe, the, the first chief engineer at Google. And Savoia's book is called The Right It, but it's a book about how do you get real data to figure out if the product or service you're developing is actually one that's going to work. So it kind of gets at the lower left-hand corner in my seven domains framework, but it does it very in inventively. And Savoya's got a number of approaches where you can go out and get your own Yoda, he calls it, your own data. Um, 
to, to convince yourself I'm on the right track or I'm not. And, and I think that's what you have to do. As a last question, I want to ask you this because it's there's a new approach to, to education now, especially coming from the yeah, U.S. side. It's like universities are, are useless. They're too expensive. They're not worth it. And online education will be the winner, teaching to, to yourself, etc. As someone who has experienced like both the world of business and academia, what's your take on on the debate between like formal education versus a bit more like informal education, meaning that you can take online courses, et cetera. So like, what's your take on that? Well, you know, there are many ways to learn and there are many opportunities to learn and many, many places where we can learn. I don't think there's any single path. Uh, I take big issue with those who say, ah, you don't need college, you don't need business school, just go out in the real world and start. I can tell you that the many entrepreneurs that we've created at London Business School since I've been there give a lot of credit to LBS for their ability to deal with the challenges they've faced along the way. And, you know, people say, can you teach entrepreneurship? Well, I don't, I don't know that we can pick up any random person off the sidewalk in London Business School, dip them <laughs> in our secret sauce and put them back on the sidewalk and now they're an entrepreneur. We, can, we can't do that. But I think what we can do for those that have the kind of mindset, comfort with uncertainty, that, and the, uh, the urge to do something new and different and better, I think we can equip them. We, as I say, we in business schools, we in universities, can equip them with tools and ways of thinking so that they're more likely to be able to overcome some of the hurdles that are inevitably going to be in their path, just as those same hurdles were in somebody else's path a generation ago. So there's a lot you can learn. It's, we are certainly not the only place you can learn that. You know, you can learn it in the School of Hard Knocks. That's a very expensive school, the School of Hard Knocks, but you can learn there too. I don't think there's a single right answer. There's learning all over the place, but learning becomes the key. I could ask so, so many more questions, but I'm, I know that you're short on time. Thank you so much for your time, for this amazing conversation. How can our uh, listeners can find your work, uh, maybe reach out to you for some mentorship? Well, you know, I, I get way too many reach outs for mentorship, and that's hard <laughs> to do on a one on one basis. But they'll find me on LinkedIn. Uh, they'll find all four of my books on Amazon. I'm pretty easy to find. And I and I always answer the, uh, the reach outs that I get. Perfect. Thank you so much, John. Thank you, Bert. Thank you for listening to this conversation. At Execute and Outlast, we are all about success as a mindset. We understand the hard work, dedication, and determination it takes to build a thriving business. If you are learning or enjoying this podcast, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. That is a great zero-cost way to support us. Grab the Execute reading list that is helping me scale my business to eight figures at this moment. You can find that at executeandoutlast.com. That is executeandoutlast.com. If you have any topic or guest suggestions, please leave them on our YouTube comments. I do read all the comments and will answer all of your questions as much as possible. Until next time.